Good afternoon. Uh, I am Mike Schwader, President of AT&T for the Mid-Atlantic Region. And on behalf of the several hundred employees of AT&T, my fellow employees here in the district, we're very pleased to be here as a sponsor of this program called Digital City, Transforming DC into a Tech Capital. We're very proud of the relationships that we have built in this city over the last several years in a number of programs, our STEM program, Aspire, where we work with people in the uh, community, such as Covenant House, a number of the high schools in uh, retention uh, and advancing education, which is so important uh, to us here in the city. I'm going to turn the podium over in a minute or two to Barbara, but I thought I would just talk about a few things that are important to us in D.C. and what we're working on. And first of all, Mr. Mayor, we're honored by your presence to be part of this today and of the great working relationship that our company has with you and your team, <clears throat> which obviously leads us to the type of uh, city that we want and where we want to grow, advance, and develop things here. Uh, just a couple figures. Between 2010 and 2012, AT&T invested in excess of $825 million in this region in our wireline and wireless network. <clears throat> in the District of uh, Columbia alone. That's over 200 million of that. Uh, recently, at the end of last year, we announced a new program which we call uh, Velocity IP, which over the next three years, AT&T will invest in excess of $14 billion across the United States in investing in an all wireless network. And what we're hoping to do is to have policies in place <clears throat> going into the 21st century that meets the needs and the investments of companies like ours, other companies that you're going to hear from that are on the, on the program as well today. So with those, inv with those investments, we hope that we're going to do our part to turn D.C. into an even more innovative city than it is at present. And we know that the, that the D.C. Chamber of Commerce has long been an advocate of that, on behalf of this of this city, uh, where we've listened to the D.C. Chamber in setting up this forum, and we're proud to be part of that. And I know that all of you know that D.C. Chamber of Commerce President and CEO Barbara Lang knows the importance of technology in the economic development of this city. And so it's my great pleasure to turn the podium over to an untiring advocate on behalf of the District of Columbia, Barbara Lang. <laughs> Michael, thank you uh, very, very much, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> you have, uh, Michael has set the vision for uh, what promises to be a session filled with vision, innovation, and creativity. All the hallmarks of our business community. AT&T deserves a very special thank you for being today's event sponsor as does DC's Department of Small and Local Business Development, our forum policy, forum partner for the year. I'd also like to thank Uber for being a sponsor for today's event and for adding a new benefit to our Chamber Perks program. All Chamber members are now eligible for a $20 discount off their first Uber ride, uh, black car ride, that is. And, um, and this is a, we have a special promotional card, and I think it is uh, someplace circulating out in the, uh, in the audience. Uh, this is a savings I know that you all uh, can appreciate, and I hope that you will use Uber as we do at the D.C. Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to also thank our other sponsors today. Uh, we are putting on these, uh, these forums, and your continued support helps support uh, our efforts. As Michael mentioned, each day our city becomes more and more a technology hub. We're not just the nation's capital, but we are evolving into a technology capital as well. The chamber continues to foster the growth of our local technology industry and advocate on its behalf. We work closely with the DC government uh, to lessen the regulatory burden for such growing industries like the technology sector. This makes our city a viable place to do business, and that just makes good economic sense for all of us. 
Today, we have some high-tech power brokers with us to discuss what we need to do as DC's business community to become not just a domestic leader in technology and innovation, but also an international player. In addition to becoming the capital of the free world, I want to see us become the tech capital of the world. And I know that we can do it. So look out, Silicon Valley. The people on today's panel are going to help take us there. And there is no pressure there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, but before I introduce them, uh, let me remind you, my staff will be walking around with uh, little cards if you'd like to ask a question at the end, because we will open it up for questions and answers from our audience. So just please signal to them that you um, would like one of the cards. So now, uh, our, um, our uh, panelists today, our esteemed panelists, Antoine Ford, president and co-founder of Enlightened Incorporated, and by the way, the new chair of the Chamber's Board of Directors. <laughs> Tony Lewis, vice president and senior executive of Verizon, Mid-Atlantic region, and by the way, a former chair of the <laughs> Chamber's Board of Directors. Karen Carrigan, President and CEO of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. Welcome. Good to be here. Thank you. And RJ Madan, COO of Optimal Solutions and Technology, and a new member of the Chamber's Board of Directors. All right. Thank you, Robert. I'll also remember that we have, um, I mentioned that we have a, a, a several members of the executive branch here, uh, here today. Thank you all for coming. And the one that we work the most with is Deputy Mayor uh, Victor Hoskins, who's sitting right down front. So thank you all for coming. Now, I anticipate. <laughs> <laughs> We anticipate this afternoon, as all these forums are, a fascinating and informative discussion. Now, in addition to our panel of experts, we have a moderator who has invested a lot of time and energy into making our nation's capital a technology hub and has made this a major part of his five-year economic plan. And if you haven't seen that, you need to read it. Not only is he, <laughs> he's got it with him. Not only is he the mayor of our great city, but he has become the moderator, the regular moderator of our policy forums, dating back to when he was chair of the council. And when he became mayor, he says, can I still do this? And I said, absolutely, we want you to do that. He's fabulous at it. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to the Honorable Vincent C. Gray, the mayor of the District of Columbia. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, and good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm actually delighted uh, to be here, and I, I really do look forward uh, to having the opportunity to do this because it's such wonderful learning experiences. You get into a job like this and, you know, you're constantly moving from one thing to the other and you wake up one day and you go like, man, this could be really a superficial experience if you let it become that. Mm -hmm. So coming here uh, is really stimulating and we do it, what, about quarterly, Barbara? So I want to thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank you for the chance to interact with some very, um, you know, stimulating folks. Uh, we have another stimulating panel today. I see we have Tony Lewis back uh, for a second time. That means he did pretty good uh, the first time. <laughs> um, and again, I try to do this as much. I had, a, I had an experience last week uh, that was hugely stimulating. I went to a lecture um, that was conducted by two um, University of Washington researchers. And it was on brain physiology, uh, brain development, neurophysiology. And it was connecting the dots between neurophysiology and early childhood education. And uh, I'm sure everybody heard the president's um, State of the Union speech uh, not so long ago, in which he talked about early childhood education. 
And I'm sure you didn't hear mention of the District of Columbia and the program that we have on early childhood education. In fact, I don't have any reservations about saying that I think we have the most robust early childhood education program in America uh, at this stage. We have a seat for every three and four year old in either one of our DC public schools, or one of our charter schools, or an early childhood uh, center. So it is really stimulating to keep up with, uh, you know, currently what's going on, and that was a great experience. How many of you knew that 92% um, that of a child's brain development takes place by the time she or he is five years of age? which argues, argues vehemently for investing in our children at the earliest possible points. And that is the nexus, obviously, to me anyway, for, for technology, that our children should be exposed to these opportunities at the earliest possible, possible point. And um, they will learn, they will, be, they will shock you at what they will be able to learn, irrespective of how young uh, they may be. Um, our tech uh, efforts in the city are really taking off. And I want to recognize Deputy Mayor Hoskins also for the work that he has done. Uh, Victor and I have worked together now for two years, a little over two years, right, Victor? And uh, it feels like I've been working with him all my life uh, because we, we work so well together. Uh, we share so many of the same values, and uh, he is a hardworking man who has brought a lot of innovation, creativity, and commitment uh, to our efforts here in the city. So, Victor, once again, thank you for what you do every day for our city. <laughs> also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize David Zipper, uh, also, who is our Director of Business Development uh, in the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development uh, Office. And he has been a huge, um, uh, hugely involved in the effort to bring more technology uh, to our city. David, thank you for what you do every day. And also, and I don't see her here, but Jennifer Boss was our first, where is she? Oh, there she is right there, excuse me. Jennifer Boss was our first tech sector strategist that we brought on board, no matter what sector you want to talk about. And she has been so good at it that we have now started to identify others, like with Eds and Meds and other things in the District of Columbia. And Jennifer has done a fantastic job with our technology program in the city. Jennifer, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, Barbara mentioned the five-year economic development uh, strategy, and there it is right there. You should rush <laughs> right home and read it if you haven't, uh, and I'm sure you'll do that. Uh, it, really is, it really is worth reading, and I think you will find a lot of emphasis on technology. And we have made a lot of efforts uh, already. First of all, the Tech Sector Enhancement Act, uh, which some of you may or may not know about, uh, Barbara and the Chamber in particular, the, uh, I thought I saw Jim Deniger. Uh, also, did I see Jim? There he is right there. The, uh, the Chamber and the Board of Trade worked very closely with us to try to get the Tech Sector Enhancement Act adopted, and we did. The only problem is, and I want to hear from our panel a little bit on that, we were unable, we were unsuccessful in getting through the legislation that would have reduced the capital gains tax from 9% down to 3%, which seemed eminently reasonable to me but for some reason it was not successful in getting through. It would have, it would have created more opportunities for angel investors uh, here in the city, which I think is one of the ways in which we can stimulate additional technology development uh, in the city. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff with the Tech Sector Enhancement Act, and we can talk further about that, but, and also the um, social e-commerce uh, bill that we got through, which has helped Living Social to be able to stay in the city and will give us hopefully a prototype of what we can do uh, with others. We've created new financial incentives. Um, how many of you are familiar with grade.dc.gov, which was a venture into technology world uh, for us? This was a company, right, Victor, that was leaving the city. They were going to go, Barbara, to Silicon Valley uh, because they thought that their fortunes would be better uh, pursued there. Um, and we said, you know, let's go over and sit down and see what these guys do. And so we sat out and went over and, and met with them, spent an entire morning over on 7th Street talking to them, learned what they do. And what they do, they have an app. They have an application that allows them to be able to measure through public input, through, uh, through um, various um, uh, reviewing, if you will, uh, social media, uh, tweeting and other, what people think of restaurants' performances in the city. 
very, it was fascinating. And while I was sitting there, I said, Victor, don't you think that this could apply to uh, public services as well? And so we did. We set off on a journey at that stage and said, let's figure out how we take this, this and figure out how we create an application for public services in the city. And we now have grade.dc.gov, uh, which is now being used with 15 agencies in the city. And in the last couple of months, it's been written, uh, it's been chronicled by Governing Magazine, which is the public service magazine uh, of the nation. And also an article was written about it in the Wall Street uh, Journal. And again, it's just another way of demonstrating what it is that we can do uh, with technology when you think about its, its potential uh, applications. Um, we are working, and I hope some of you all will work with us. I hope the panelists will work with us. I hope those in the audience will work with us to, among our, I don't know, 14,000, 15,000 young people who will get jobs for six weeks this summer, we want to expose as many of them as we possibly can to technology opportunities. Uh, I had a chance to speak recently at Microsoft, and they are going to take a number of young people uh, this uh, summer, uh, and we're going to work with them, for young, with young people that are in their apprenticeship programs, to be able to bring them into the city, and I hope you will open your doors to be able uh, to do that. Um, let, me, let me cut this a little bit short. Uh, we've had trade missions to China, to South Africa, to Singapore. We've opened the D.C. China Center uh, in Shanghai last June when we were there. Um, we are working to try to create more technology business opportunities in the city. We've been to meetups. Anybody ever, here, any, ever been to a tech meetup? You need to go to one of those. It is absolutely, uh, it is absolutely fascinating. First one I ever went to, we went to, it was Victor and David said, let's go to a tech meetup tonight. <laughs> and so, we, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we went, to, we went over to George Washington University to Lisner Auditorium. And there must have been 500 people in this place. And they bring folks up, Pete Corbett, who is the guy who runs them, he brings person after person after person up, and they present whatever innovative application that they may have developed. And then we'll talk about how they proliferate what it is that they have done. So I've been to several tech meetups since I was at DC Week, uh, which is a uh, conference where, what, a couple thousand people come uh, to participate uh, in the uh, technology development in the city. Accelerator launches, tech rallies, uh, startups, and um, in about a week, about a week, week, a little over a week, we're going to South by Southwest, which is the technology mm -hmm. conference nationally. It's in Austin, Texas. And we are going to really promote the District of Columbia as a tech uh, hub, as a tech uh, center. So in any event, um, this is, this is at, at the core, if you will, of our, um, our strategy to do two things. One, over the next five years to generate $1 billion of additional revenue uh, in the city. And then secondly, to create 100,000 new jobs. 20,000 of which would be in the technology uh, sector. Um, so these folks to my left, your right, will have a key role in uh, helping to make that happen. And um, let's see, I want to know before, you, uh, before we leave, how many jobs are you all going to create? <laughs> <laughs> um, in any event, um, it, is a, it, is, it is at the core, if you will, of our technology strategy. Uh, we already can see the importance of being able to move as much as we can away from dependence upon the federal government. Uh, we have been a company town for decades, and we simply can't afford to do that anymore. Uh, you see what sequestration is about to bring. Uh, we know that on the revenue side, we could lose as much as $50 million uh, because of reductions in income taxes, property taxes, and sales taxes. And on the programmatic side, uh, that is in education, health, homeland security, uh, environment, and a couple of other areas, we could lose as much as $60 million, $110 million that could affect the District of Columbia. We have got to find ways to do business otherwise. And it just seems to me and others that the best prospect we have for doing something new, doing something that we really haven't done significantly before, is in the technology arena. So that's what today's discussion is about. No pressure, guys, but we want to leave here uh, today knowing exactly what it is that the uh, city will have to do in order to better prepare itself to continue to move uh, in this direction.
Thank you all. I think what we want to do is give you all a chance to uh, maybe make an opening two or three minute statement based on the comments that uh, made were, Mike by, were made by Michael and Barbara and then myself, uh, and then we'll move into the uh, dialogue. So Antoine, why don't we start with you? Oh, great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, as a technology company, uh, Enlighten is, is uh, intricately excited about what's happening in the city. Um, a, a large portion of what we do is in the public safety sector uh, for the District of Columbia. Um, one of the mayor's organizations, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, we literally do much of the system integration work when it comes to automating processes of in the public safety sector. From the point of um, dealing with individuals when they get arrested to the point where they uh, are returning citizens. And we've been able to leverage this technology to be able to make the city more efficient. Well, when you're making the city more efficient, in, in particularly in the public safety sector, we're able to put people and policemen in the right position to make us a safer city. Uh, that's just one example of being able to leverage technology to make people safer. Um, we're excited about what we're hearing about from the universities. I think Ajin has a couple of things in, in that area. But I think technology, if leveraged the right, right way, really brings business efficiencies. And I think one of the most important thing there is letting the business drive technology as opposed to having technology try to find a place for it. And I think the city's been um, heavily involved in making sure there's a business need for it. I'm excited about the number of small businesses that are growing and the partnerships I'm, I'm seeing uh, amongst the large businesses, as I see, as I see my, my friend here. But I think that's an important partnership where we're able to have small businesses linked with the large businesses to bring solutions to the table. Thank you. Karen? Uh, yes, great to be here, um, and an honor to be with such a distinguished uh, group uh, to talk about um, making uh, DC a, a tech hub. I've, uh, uh, I've, uh, I came to DC in 1982, and I most, I've been in and out of DC, but mostly here, and it's just uh, amazing to see the transformation uh, in the city, live through, I guess, all the chapters, if you will, of the good times and the bad times, and certainly over the past decade, the city has been on an incredible roll. And I think, um, you know, there's, a, a, I think part of, I think, getting, you know, DC to a, a place as a, as a world-class, you know, technology hub really is, you know, continuing this momentum uh, and building on the strengths. I mean, certainly, um, you know, the tremendous human capital here, uh, that uh, the, the density of human capital, the wealth uh, in the city, uh, this uh, new uh, entrepreneurial spark uh, that we see by entrepreneur business leaders in terms of the accelerators and the incubators and the 1776 initiatives and the events that uh, you went to as well, Mayor. I mean, those are all, all the things that other places are doing. Um, you know, New York, um, mimicking Silicon Valley, moving over to New York and Boston uh, to make uh, their localities uh, technology hubs. Um, um, uh, and also building on these, in, these tremendous investments. I mean, that these network uh, uh, players, both the Verizons and the AT&Ts are making, I mean, millions, you know, in DC, you know, billions, um, you know, Michael said the, uh, the $14 billion investment that will be made. I mean, this is critically important. Um, uh, the, uh, this, uh, uh, the internet uh, infrastructure, if you will, to the, um, you know, to the small business sector, to the entrepreneurial sector, um, and really is the platform uh, for, uh, you know, technology companies. So encouraging that uh, investment is critical and encouraging investment in, in technology businesses. And uh, I was uh, one of those who uh, was saddened to see uh, the removal of the 3% uh, capital gains tax. Uh, so was I. Yes, I know you were, because um, for, for several reasons. I mean, number one, you know, this mayor, uh, the, in terms of, you know, where you are and, and the, the, the players around you, Virginia, um, but also what, you know, states uh, are doing in terms of moving in a, that really want the business, really want the technology sector, really want the capital. And we know capital and, and labor are highly mobile. Um, you know, cutting taxes and lowering taxes in order to attract uh, this investment. So 
um, with that, um, uh, you know, I'll be on board supporting you the next time. And, and you know, zeroing out capital gains is something that, <laughs> that we would like to see. Um, but again, all, again, it all boils down to investment. And, um, and, and, and that is really a critical component. And then bringing all, of course, these parts together, all these strengths uh, to help make uh, DC uh, the uh, digital capital of the world that it can be. So. Thank you. Tony? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me, let me start my comments with a couple of things that both you and Barbara pointed out that, that I, I think demonstrate where we can go if, in fact, we continue to do the kind of things to encourage uh, technology investments. And, and we, we say technology, we say investment, these are words that get scattered. So let's think about them practically. So Barbara mentioned Uber. So Uber is innovation in its simplest form. But Uber is enabled because there are wireless networks above this city that allow smartphones to operate. Their entire plan was based on mobility and your ability to command what you wanted as an individual customer. That in itself is innovative technology. If at any point you attempt to squash that with rules or regulations that don't allow that company to think the way they should in order to allow their customers to get what they want, technology investment fails. Uber is a fantastic example of the good way to operate in a great technology city. Secondly, your application that you just pointed out, it's the same principle. Customers want the ability to access any type of service, including government, the way that they want to. We're on the verge of greatness. Now we could be a good city from a technology perspective pretty easily at this point. We can be great as you want us to when we say, what are the things that we need to do not just from an economic incentive uh, perspective, but from an overall partnership mm -hmm. and operating with the customer's perspective to get us to the place where people say, I have to live in Washington. There couldn't be a better place for me to live, not just because I can do X, Y, Z with this technology, but because technology has allowed me to make my life simpler. If my life is simpler, I definitely wanna live it. We have all the tools and this is a fantastic city. What we need to concentrate on now is what are the things that impede us from being great? We do those things, I think the path to greatness is right in front of us. Thank you, Tony. Ajay? I couldn't agree more. Um, it is about a path from good to great. There's no question in my mind about that. You were talking a little bit about our technology base and the company town. If you actually start taking a look at the numbers, we're a little bit stronger than Silicon Valley. If you start taking a look at technology per person in this area, we're stronger than Silicon Valley. But why don't we have that reputation? Why don't people recognize that? One, I think a lot of the innovation is done in the top secret world. Mm -hmm. And we probably have talent here that's not recognized, and then it's difficult to attract more people. Secondly, like you said, innovation versus gridlock. We gotta come to grips between these two things, mm -hmm. and we have to promote ourselves as a more innovative type of region and we have to cooperate together. I think uh, in looking at some of the regions like Silicon Valley, like Boston, like Washington, like Raleigh-Durham, what you find is a very strong partnership between the federal government, the local government, the universities, the high schools, and most importantly, the businesses are at the table and the businesses are not just there to find people, they're there making investments. They're working with the universities on innovation and research. They're actually helping with the tech transfer piece. I'll give you an example. I think a few years ago, there was a researcher that was looking at ways to perform more cardiac diagnostics without uh, invasive types of approaches. And they figured out the deeper that they went on the ultrasound, the sounds were a little bit different. Somebody figured out, gee, we could use this to detect people out in the water, submarines, they make different noises at different depths and they found a way to transfer that technology. Now that can only happen in a lab, that type of thing, but it has to get out there into the marketplace. Also in terms of big assets, I think um, DC, we have this reputation, not necessarily of innovation, but more development and operations and maintenance in the technology space. 
but I might argue when it comes to the international front, if you take a look at the DC asset, we are very good at large scale systems implementation. And when I talk about that, if you start thinking about India and China, you have a billion and a half people that are coming into the middle class. They are now demanding basic services like 911, et cetera. We have the expertise there in this town because of this government focus. That is something we can clearly export there. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for your um, opening statements. And I guess I alluded to the Tech Sector Enhancement Act um, in my comments. Um, Karen talked about it. You alluded to it a little bit in terms of gridlock. Um, now, to me, it just seemed like a no-brainer. What we were saying basically was we have a capital gains tax of almost 9%. In order to encourage angel investors uh, to do more in the city, we're going to reduce uh, the tax on return on those investments, those investments going forward, not retroactive, but going forward to 3%. Yet we couldn't get it through. Uh, a case was made. Some of the some of the points were preposterous to me in terms of the uh, the uh, reaction to it. What do we need to do in order to be? And I'm I'm asking the question of the entire panel. What do we need to do to achieve success? What we did so it didn't die was to refer to the tax revision commission, and we hope that they see the wisdom of going forward with this. But apart from that, what, what does the city need to do to make the case for encouraging people to invest with that kind of uh, return on investment? I think it's a combination of two things. And we were talking a little bit mm -hmm. about people on the investment side right. and more participation from the public, right? Right. And then on the back side, when the business then becomes successful, they need to have some runway where they can continue to grow in this area, employ more people. And I think it's a twofold approach, both on the front end and the back end. Certainly tax but, policy is very helpful on the back end. But it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the tech sector that resisted this. It was the policymakers that resisted this. How do we get policymakers in this city to a different place to be able to move this forward? Well, I think one of the ways, um, and, and, and I guess, I mean, it's something you have to be pretty relentless on is just in terms of, you know, competition, you know, what others are doing to track, you know, money uh, and investment, uh, you know, what other states are doing, what other countries are doing from a tax policy perspective. And if the money is not going to come here, it's going to go somewhere else. And I think this is going to be even more critically important um, for DC and other places in terms of, you know, people looking at, you know, their, their taxes on investment. Once uh, the Jumpstart our, Bus our Jumpstart our Business Startup Act, which was signed by President Obama on April 5th, and now is sitting over the SEC, we're waiting for those rules to dislodge, where you are, where that allowed for equity-based crowdfunding, where, you know, in DC, you can establish your own platforms for investment in local business and technology businesses, broad businesses, democratizes access to capital and gives people, average people in the city of the DC, the opportunity to invest in these businesses. So there shouldn't be a tax on individual people to invest in these businesses to build wealth for the city mm -hmm. and also for themselves. But there is, yeah. and it's a huge tax. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look at, at Maryland, <clears throat> Maryland's tax is five and three quarters percent. Mm -hmm. Virginia's tax is zero. Mm -hmm. right. That's the region that we are competing in. Right. Exactly. And yet, yet our policymakers made a decision to preserve a tax that's all, it's 8.95 percent. You know, when I said something, I, I got a little upset about it. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I said at a point that three percent of something is better than nine percent of nothing. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we haven't gotten much of anything out of this because who's going to invest in an environment where you're being taxed like that? So I guess my question, I continue, I don't want to be you know, redundant, but I want to continue to ask the question. I'll ask it of Tony and Antoine uh, at this stage. What is it that we need to do? Antoine, you, you are the, the chairman of the mm -hmm. board. Your CEO did a great job. Mm -hmm. She was yeah. out there walking the halls of the council doing the best that she could to make the argument. 
But you know what? I've been on the council too. And you look out there and you see one voice. I mean, I think and there's a bunch of voices on the other side yeah. that may or may not be enlightened. Mm -hmm. One of the things I know uh, Barbara talks about is making sure she's not the single voice and we go with her. And, and I think it's important that we understand, you mentioned Virginia, and often when we are looking at, and Aja knows this, when we go and look at our, some of the largest integrators and system, fo system folks, they're in Virginia, they're in Northern Virginia, and they're there because of the tax issues. If we're able to lower the tax and then attract them with the infrastructure in the city, I, I think we can walk the halls and I think we actually do marketing over to Northern Virginia. I mean, they're successful because of the tax issues and they, they stay there. Uh, I think we've started to market to them. We've had more Northern Virginia companies start to join the chamber now. Uh, but I think, it's, it's, I think we aggressively market some of the programs that you have to the Northern Virginia businesses and we, get the ta and we show that we can get X number of businesses to move in the city if we do this tax. I think the policymakers will certainly look at that because we're talking some of the largest companies in the world right across the bridge. But which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Right. Do they, do they move and then we change the policies no. or do we change the policies and they move? Yeah, see, see, this is, Mr. Mayor, this is, it's like arguing religion. <laughs> tax, it is religion, right? <laughs> tax policy, uh, certainly from a business perspective, is a no-brainer. This is just pure business logic. And so it is frustrating when you sit in front of people, and uh, I'm lucky or unlucky enough to see this uh, across many cities, uh, who simply refuse to believe the facts. Uh, and that's what it gets down to sometimes. So from a practical perspective, unfortunately, sometimes it may get to mm -hmm. seeing actual movement, but we've got to, to concentrate them uh, and, and everybody on the reality of what happens when you allow this kind of investment to take place in a city. When, when you can see, and you can see the benefits even in the policies today of what you have, you have to imagine what it could be if you make those changes. So maybe the changes are more incremental. Maybe there are opportunities for, for those folks who hesitate to make what they perceive as a broad stroke for smaller strokes. But if they take the time to see how it works and could work in the city, then I think you have at least a better opportunity to sway this. And you know, I, I say this knowing it's the way we operate. It'd be lovely to get everybody involved in the conversation, meaning for me, customers. People have to demand, and they do, they demand better services from us each and every day. Mm -hmm. If all policymakers and all businesses are hearing the same voice, then we should be on the same path. And when it isn't happening, we've also got to encourage the individual customers to say, what are you doing? How could you possibly make that kind of decision that's holding back my city? <clears throat> I um, respectfully believe the taxes should go to zero. And as long as you we, have we, we couldn't even get it to three. <laughs> right, 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 right. Right. And I think maybe you I went think for that, zero, you could have got it to three. Right. Who knows, right? Right. I think that when you have a border state that's at zero mm -hmm. and you're trying to attract people in there, you're asking them to dislocate. And their argument is already about, hey, we're worried about the rent issue. So the argument has to be, we're not going to tax you and we're going to provide you a better incentive to come in here. And we are Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be the argument. I think the community has to get behind that argument. And uh, I think that in itself will attract a more entre entrepreneurial crowd uh, to come here. Well, remember this tax was on, or would have been on, um, somebody investing, right. angel investors, right. investing in somebody's firm, somebody's startup, somebody's accelerator. And instead of having to pay 9% on whatever the money they may make, mm. recognizing there's a tremendous risk that you're taking in the first place on these startups, you would, have, you would have paid 3%. We couldn't even get that through. This isn't even on the company itself, which still would pay whatever corporate taxes, you know, 9% or 10% or whatever corporate taxes have to be paid. Mm -hmm. These were the people who would have put up money to say, I'm going to help you, IJ, get this good idea off the ground. And if you make money, um, I'll only have to pay 3% on the return as opposed to 9 I think you, you get back into this notion that I opened earlier. If you have a partnering with the university, I mean, that is a DC asset. You have those in the city. And if you can create those partnerships and draw some of those smaller organizations to either be nearby the university, foster stronger relationships with the university, I think that's part of your draw there too. So I, I strongly would support 0% just to get the people here. You know, once the environment changes and you have a different business landscape, 
you then actually have an opportunity for a different type of analysis at that juncture. And if you find that, all right, technology is here, but they're not contributing their proportionate share and they're draining government services, that's a different dialogue, but that's after they're established here. You know, we have a, what I would call, you may call it something different, I, we have a substantially imported workforce. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but of the people who work in the District of Columbia, only about 30% actually live in the mm -hmm. city. Mm -hmm. What can we do to be able to, as we try to develop technology, and um, I think the comment, I guess it was you, Tony, that made the comment that we can be good or we can be great. If we want to be great, then we will really uh, notch up our game in terms of technology firms in the city. But what is it that's going to have us not only have more firms in the city, but have people who live in the city actually work in the jobs that are going to be created? Um, that, that will have a, ma a yeah. major impact on our tax base also. Yeah, I mean, it, it, being a native Washingtonian, I have a real passion for that because one of the issues that we find is it starts in the school system. I mean, you talked about that earlier. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about was uh, the high school partnerships that we're starting to see and the college partnerships being able to have even certificate programs that would allow individuals to get certificates in programming, cybersecurity, um, jobs that are high demand right now. I mean, one of the issues that we've seen uh, is that the individuals that I may hire or that, that these guys may hire are going to be required to have these certificates in these programs if we're able to get that into individuals that are in high school and may not want to go to college necessarily. They are as valuable to me being able to program in these languages and have cybersecurity certification as somebody coming out with a four-year degree. Because for me, I will hire them on the spot. I have, I have jobs right now that when I advertise for them, I'm looking for folks in DC. I'm a native, I've been here my whole life, I love this city. Um, I will literally tell my recruiters, look for someone that has this. But at the end of the day, uh, my customer is gonna say, I want somebody who has these credentials, period. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I'm, we're extremely passionate about um, I'm a little biased towards GW going there undergrad and grad, but working with the universities there to say, put the programs in. I, I had to put that plug in there for you. Um, <laughs> but literally working with uh, the School of Business um, and their folks to be able to say, look at the certificate programs, look where the jobs are coming, and be able to put these programs in place to hire in this city, even down in the high school level. Karen? The issue, the issue, the issue I'm raising at this stage is how do we create a more indigenous workforce? Um, what happens is that if we're, we're you know, creating new firms, expanding firms, uh, expanding the economic base from a corporate perspective, but then we wind up with no more people employed in the District of Columbia than the percentage we have now, which is three out of every 10. How do we improve upon that? Well, I hate to keep talking about taxes, <laughs> um, you know, and, and tax policy, but, you know, certainly, uh, you know, tax rates matter, uh, you know, when it comes to, um, uh, you know, the D.C. and how it stacks up, you know, against, uh, you know, its neighbors and particularly Virginia uh, in terms of uh, personal income taxes and, you know, all the other, um, you know, uh, types of taxes as well. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, I think this whole notion of creating a technology hub, you know, goes hand in hand with driving new residents into the city. And, and so the type of people that, you know, are attracted, you know, to being entrepreneurs uh, in this industry. And, you know, the trends that we see in terms of, you know, the entrepreneur, or young people and people who may start these businesses or are attracted to starting these businesses you know, wanting to live, you know, in cities and in urban areas. So um, I don't know if this is a chicken and egg type. I think it can work, you know, together that in terms of creating, you know, a technology hub, in terms of creating um, an, uh, an entrepreneurial culture and more people wanting to start businesses here, uh, that that will lend itself to increasing the population uh, of, the, of the district. What do you think, Tony? Yeah. You work for, obviously, a major, major firm. Yeah, and I've had a chance to uh, move away and move back. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so certainly, I'll speak you know, personally first, uh, you know, I moved back into the city for an individual quality of life. You know, and so, so I, I say that to say, again, 
there, there are some good things already happening uh, through, through your administration and others that have gotten us to the place that we are. So when you think about what are the things that we have to do in order to move this forward, you do have to think about a couple of things that are counter to what you're talking about. And that is individuals today uh, that are either, quote, growing up today or are young at heart are, are living a borderless lifestyle. You know, their ability to do any and everything they can mobily is very important to them. That's including work. So, so I think you have to start to segregate it into industries. When you think about how am I going to attract, quote, jobs to the city, is that someone who's literally working and paying a business tax <laughs> uh, in the city, or are they affording opportunities for the city, by the city, through this mobile application, we're quickly moving in a direction where it won't matter where you live for certain segments of, of industry. So mm -hmm. you talked about cybersecurity, one near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm amazed at the number of job opportunities being created by cybersecurity already. All the major institutions that have anything going for themselves already have curriculum in place mm -hmm. because they recognize the value of those positions and what they're going to do for what's going to be a mobile, uh, even more mobile environment. Uh, but where those jobs sit, that'll be where's the best quality of life for me. So it really gets back to, Karen, what you were saying, what attracts people to the city and how do you keep them here so that they bring the work to the city? So it's not the conventional, I'm going to pop my company down and, and create jobs here, which is a fine model, but a newer model will be where should I work, where would I want my peers to be working in order to accomplish these things for my business? What do you all think with some specificity then uh, in terms of how we accomplish that? We, we are in a region where we clearly are competing. Mm -hmm. There's no question about that. Nobody would argue <clears throat> against that, it seems to me. Um, we, we've talked about creating 100,000 jobs over the next five years. How do, we, how do we not, let's say we are successful, that we created 100,000 jobs. How would we feel if 70,000 of those jobs are filled by people who live in some other jurisdiction? What, what have we really accomplished? And how do we avoid that? That's the more important issue for me. How do we avoid winding up having simply proliferated more jobs for people who either live somewhere else when they get the job? As Antoine said, he works assiduously to find people in the district and oftentimes, I guess, doesn't, maybe three out of 10 times like other people do. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, or uh, that we don't wind up just having companies who don't have that kind of commitment uh, to the city. Yeah. Maybe because of our own policies or maybe because they just don't have the, uh, the commitment to the city in the first place. Well, and you said both, both huge statements here, right? So it's the policies. You know, why, I ask myself, why do people move to the city? You know, what's important to them? And if you generalize that statement, we know uh, the, the, the answer to the question, it's the schools, it's the quality of life, mm -hmm. it's low crime, it's low taxes, it's the things that we all know. Now the execution of those and the reality of what we can do as a city to enable those things, so different because we have a realistic view. You have a budget, you've got all the things that you need to do in order to run the city. So it's that middle balance of your earlier point how do we as we and the policymakers move the ball up a bit so that you can have an attraction for folks to come? Because my belief is if they get here, they stay because of everything that this city has to offer. So it's that initial attraction, but it's all the things that you just pointed out that we actually would have to move. And I know I'm making a statement that you know, that's very difficult to do for all the wrong reasons. But to get those 100,000, to get people in here and to, to actually move companies in, you have to do those things. It has to be done because there are too many choices locally for them. It'd be different if this was an island. It's too easy to move into Virginia or, mm -hmm. or, or, or suburban Maryland or, or yeah. up to Baltimore. Yeah. It's too easy. So you have to be ultra attractive, which means you have to change policy. You've got to make it easy for people to come in and say, I love this town. This is perfect for me and my family. I've got to be here. Let me ask each one of you, if you could change one policy right now that you believe would facilitate <laughs> growth in the indigenous workforce, Without realistically <laughs> now, <you> know, <laughs> what, what would you do that would get us from 30% to, let's say, uh, in five years when we hope to have 100,000 jobs, it would get us from 30% to 50%? <clears throat> I think in Fairfax County, 70% of the people that grew up in Fairfax County work in Fairfax County. 
So I think you have to get the people that are here first to make sure they stay here. Mm -hmm. And I think those are through those programs that Antoine was talking about, P-TECH up in New York, partnership between um, educational institutions and private sector to make sure that people that graduate from high school also have upward migration through an associate's degree and can get a job here. Secondly, if you're looking at attracting people and um, you're, you've hopefully captured the people that went to the universities and are keeping them here. Third piece, to get people into the city, I think there has to be not only that good quality of life, but they care about public education and public safety. For that middle crowd, people that graduate from GW, they care about the electricity of the city. Let's, let's face it, they want their job, but they also like being social. And uh, you have to take a look at housing policy too. Make sure that they have a place that they can afford to be here and it's in, in great areas of the city as well. Okay. Karen, what would you change? I hope you don't think I'm so obsessed with taxes, but I guess I am today. <laughs> we, do. I don't we, do. we, we all are. Okay. Good. Good. I guess I'm pretty obsessed with taxes. I, I don't know why, but yeah, right. um, you know, I I think um, well, there was if I could do two things, you know, with the tax system, I would you know cut the individual income tax to make it more competitive, you know, to lower to lower the individual income tax. Also, I mean, this whole this capital gains. How would tax, you make up the gap? Um, well, I'd have to look at your budget, sir, to see how it's <laughs> <laughs> Well, you, I mean, you, you got basically three choices. You got income taxes, property taxes, and sales taxes. That's where 80% or more of our revenue comes from. Mm -hmm. So if you cut the income taxes, which is an interesting idea, you got to be able to figure out how you run the city some other kind of way. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll figure out a way to do that. <laughs> and then, I mean, the other thing, I mean, I don't know if there's something interesting you could do. Again, I'm, I mean, I, you know, if... I think there's tremendous potential uh, in, uh, in, in the district for entrepreneurship and encouraging entrepreneurship and getting more people to start businesses and getting more people to come here and start and grow businesses. And I don't know if there's something interesting that you could do, maybe in terms of the capital gains tax, in terms of zeroing out capital gains, but then giving some type of tax incentive for people that start businesses here and live here as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know maybe so that they would they would get some kind of tax break by virtue of having a business here and actually um, being yes a residing city. residing as well mm -hmm. and I don't know what that would look like um, but um, and um, you know but again going back to this this whole you know building DC as a technology hub and entrepreneurship I mean I think there um, there's latent talent here you know, and encouraging more people to start businesses. I think, you know, there's a rebranding or a branding, I think, that needs to be done. Um, sort of what you alluded to before, is that, you know, we're, we've got a lot here. We're sort of known as sort of a gridlock city, right, and a government city, but there's so much more. And um, anyway, but the, on the tax side, those are my couple ideas. I, again, sorry I'm so tax focused. <laughs> no, no, yeah. you're doing it for us. Thank okay, you. Right. That's I don't think you're it's a panel. I don't yeah. think you're alone in those sentiments either. <laughs> Antoine, what one policy would you change? Um, I, I think I would augment your DC first policy. I mean, and that's a requirement for, um, if there's a contract that you do business with the district government, 51% uh, of the staff uh, needs to be in DC or you have to show that uh, you've actually attempted to do that. One of the things I would do is, is I would have DOES not only say that you have to report on it, but DOES should have a training program such that they have people that are already certified on certain areas of your contracting and you have your resources available to you at that point, not looking at DOS people just having a database, but these people already have certifications, and we are required to hire some of those folks. Right now, it's just a reporting exercise that I'm attempting to do it, but I'm saying that they should go a little further, and I, and, and I talked to them about the training programs, but show value that I have people that are certified in what you're looking for, mm -hmm. and these individuals have to be hired if you want to do contracting with the District of Columbia. So you would further strengthen first. I would further strengthen because right now people do it. It's 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 a, it's a it's a reporting exercise. I would say you know what if we're looking for individuals that happen to be in the technology, cybersecurity specialists, or .NET or Java developers, we have them available. They've passed the test that you told us industry that you want them to pass, because industry we would provide to you the criteria that we're looking for. DOS would then train them, 
and provide them as resources. If I want to do business with the district, I have to hire them. Because it, it solves one problem I have with finding them, and it solves one problem with saying of the 100,000 jobs that you're creating them, you're saying these people live in the city, and you then have to hire them. Tony, what one policy would you change? Well, you know, I can't give you one, Mr. Mayor, because you know <laughs> we're, we're so large that you know most of your policies affect my business. So, so let me let me describe it this way. Uh, in very simple terms, uh, all I need for you to do uh, is to have your agencies embrace exactly what your theory about technology is. If everybody understood and followed your view that you've got to encourage technology companies, then I would have the freedoms to continue to do the kind of things we've done in the past and improve on those with the, the folks that we have here on the ground, the platforms that we've built to enable all the job creation that you do. So very simply for me, it's, it's having folks embrace change because this is a changing environment. You can't look to the past. You've got to look to the future and they can follow your lead because you've already started that with the task force you put together. Okay. I would just like to add one thing before you move on to the next question. I think the one of the most important things that I kind of learned in looking at these different regions, Silicon Valley has this boundarylessness. I mean, this, this view that they can do anything that they want to do, and I think that attracts people, especially when they're in that startup mode. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily what we have here. So if you kind of asked what are the one or two things, mm -hmm. one, you know, use your office to start talking about that. Two, in terms of reshaping economics, I think you need serial entrepreneurs to stay here because there is a, a business cycle. And third, I think we have terrific universities that uh, have terrific programs in technology, but I'm not quite sure they teach serial <laughs> entrepreneurship, and I think mm -hmm. that we have to combine these two. If you look at some of the firms, startups in Silicon Valley, and surprisingly, I looked at some numbers, and this area had more startups than Silicon Valley. What we're kind of finding is, that, finding is that these firms get bought out. And these people that started up these companies, they now realize when they were bought out, they can take this technology, and now they can scale. But they stay in the area. They don't go to an island in, in Aruba or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And then you also find the secondary group that maybe they, they came in at a later stage and they've learned quite a bit. And then they split off and they create their own firms in their own environment. And because they've established some of those social networks, they now find some of the people that we worked with in the past to participate in that company in that area. So I think that th that's a very important factor there. You mentioned universities and each one of you in your own way has alluded to education. Um, we have what I guess I, I think appropriately can be phrased as a fledgling community college. Uh, we were the last people in the nation to have a community college and we still haven't fleshed it out in a way that it has a clear um, identity. Do you believe that a community college has any particular role to play in helping us grow the technology sector uh, here? Um, if so, why so? If not, why not? I think um, a community college teaming with a high school that has a strong STEM program can be a powerful force because you're using existing assets and now you're repurposing them. In terms of can that community college be a draw to bring other people in, it's here mainly to serve the local community. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's very important. Mm -hmm. I also think uh, with the institutions here, we need to work with them and we need to strengthen them because you find in many areas they are kind of the draw, not only the, the allure of Washington, D.C., but also the strong programs here. They need to have top-notch, top-of-mind programs that people identify with so that we can bring that talent here. Antoine, if so, why so? If not, why not? Um, I believe it's, it's critical because often the community college uh, is really so serving the local community. And I'm looking at that as a great place to be a feeder for jobs. Um, often the four-year universities have folks that come into D.C., come here, and then go back home. Right. And so we're losing that, those folks that we're educating here. I think often community college have folks that are, want a good opportunity. They, they, they come in. They're coming in for a couple of years, and they're looking for an opportunity immediately. Um, for us, you know, we, we were happy when we saw the, the community college start to grow because we saw this as a great opportunity to start recruiting. 
Um, one of the things that, um, and again, I'm gonna stay on cyber for a while because, I mean, as he said, it's near and dear to, to his heart, but it should be near and dear to most people's hearts here because if you're doing banking right now, the banks are being attacked. And this, in the vulnerability that's out here right now, if you get those folks focused in an area, um, it is almost an unlimited job supply for people that know cybersecurity, both in the Intel community um, as well as the uh, non-Intel community because of the folks right now. China has a dedicated government agency for cybersecurity for attacking the United States. That is their job. Um, we have individuals here that have trained the right way. The jobs can immediately stay in the city because if one place is going to be attacked, it's going to be Washington, D.C. because of what's here. And so I would really focus in that area. If I had one thing to do with community college, we should start a cyber program with them. Tony? If, if we have an opportunity to give one child uh, an education and that is the vehicle, then we should do just that. I mean, my view is we've got to have enough choices here and everywhere else so that every student who wants the opportunity for, the, for, for further education can get it. So in that context, yes. And the reasons we've stated already, I mean, I, the, the jobs of the future will require levels, levels of expertise that uh, we haven't seen yet. I mean, it's going to be uh, extremely um, uh, thought intensive work. Uh, most of you are going to want solutions in your lives. It's not going to be an individual product or service, but how do I accomplish X? And so the children being educated today need to be thinking from a solutions perspective. So if this community college could focus on something of that nature, that would make sense to me. But in any form, it's got to be, we've got these children out there, they need to be educated. Where's the right place for them to get that education? Karen? Yeah, I agree with, with all uh, what's been said. I think it is, it's critical, particularly if you want to be a technology hub, and particularly if you want, you know, you need for, you know, um, workers or future workers for a place to go in order to have the skills to work at these technology companies. Also, I think it's, um, it's a good um, for entrepreneurship education and for um, you know, teaching entrepreneurship who want to become entrepreneurs and all the skills that they need. Uh, community college is a great place to go. I think particularly if you have business leaders and mentors and people who have run businesses who are teaching those courses, because the more that you are exposed, you know, to an individual who's a business, you know, is, you are, it, you see what it's like, it's real, I can do that. I think more apt that person will become, you know, a business person themselves. So, um, yeah, I think community, yeah, it, it can and, and, and should play a critical role. Uh, any one of you, what, what do you believe needs to be done more to assure that the community college's curriculum is attuned to, in this instance, the emerging technology needs in the city? I think she mentioned something that was, I'm not sure if they're involved with business leaders. Um, I know that early on when we started the company, I did not have someone being a mentor for me. Mm -hmm. So we made certain mistakes that um, we're blessed enough to recover from them, but these were mistakes that slowed our growth. Um, once we got mentors, it really helped out. And one of the things that would be critical in the community college would be having individuals, I saw Pedro out there, but having individuals like Pedro, who I did talk to when we started, um, who were able to say, this is what I did, don't do this. Um, but able to really, if you're t teaching someone about entrepreneurship, particularly in the tech sector, um, being able to really have a business person being a part of setting the curriculum because you really had that person, uh, you know, who's, who's experienced, um, who can tell you, tell you certain issues, ways of doing business, ways of leveraging your technology. Um, if they're not teaching, certainly they should be part of the curriculum development. How do you create a community college that is nimble enough to really be effectively responsible. A community college and a four-year university are very different places to me. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a community college is an entity that's going to be much more attuned to the pragmatic, and that is what jobs are being created, how does the community college respond to that, or the community college that is influencing the creation uh, of jobs. Let me give you an example. Um, many of us follow the, the, the uh, initiative in Maryland that involved uh, development of casinos. Almost in the immediate aftermath of that initiative being approved, I, 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 heard, I read a report that the Anne Arundel Community College had started a, a course, wow. a training course, to teach people wow. how to deal, deal cards. 
I mean, they obviously, they obviously were nimble enough to respond. They, they did that within a week, that they had a course that was ready up and, you know, to run and attract people because they knew that there were going to be jobs associated with that. And I'd be surprised if you, you can almost be sure that, mm. unlike us, seven in 10 jobs working in casinos will not come from somewhere else, and very few will probably come from the District of Columbia. How do we create that kind of nimble environment in our own university, college, community college environment to be able to be immediately responsive to emerging trends? Yeah, so two quick things come to mind on that, and certainly number one is going to be the leadership of the university and their ability to reach out mm -hmm. to the community because there's, there's never enough of us out there to, to mentor or to provide this, but there's certainly all types of think tanks, et cetera, who are looking at the jobs of the future. So certainly the leadership has to have in their mind, I've got to understand my neighborhood, my street, my, my, my ward, everything else about the city in order to be able to make that projection. Two, they gotta be courageous because you're gonna have to take some risk. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to jump out there ahead of the curve in order to put yourself in position to provide the kind of education that students may need for the type of jobs available. And then three, while we're here today, they've got to use technology. You're nimble because you can create a course online within a couple of days. And at least it's a start. It's, it's saying to your student, your, your customers out there, I've got the ability to educate you so that you can get a job by X date. That will only happen if you use everything available to you. And that's got to be the technology to get you information pulled from anywhere and get it into a classroom setting, not this, but tablet, in order to educate mm -hmm. your students. Can, can we do that with technology? Can yes. we be nimble enough in our community college to have the college immediately responsive to emerging opportunities so that our residents are trained and then hired for them. I believe we absolutely can. I mean, just look at the examples of online course, courses that are available to you free today. I mean, you can take courses from MIT, Harvard, online today, free. Now, what are they doing? They're setting up a model for the future. Mm -hmm. But today, access to information is as easy as opening your smartphone. So yes, it can if you've got the right people in place mm -hmm. who are leading that university to say, we're going to go down this path, we're gonna take this bet, which means there will be pluses and minuses to that, but you have the runway so that yes, you can be that nimble uh, if you take, take the, you know, have the courage to take the risk. What do you think, Ajay? I agree, I mean, I, it's always has struck me at the high school level, you know, this Khan Academy they teach in a different way. And if you kind of repurpose the high schools to kind of focus on people to identify their areas of weakness, then you're not teaching generically. Mm -hmm. You're teaching specialized, and why not take that up to the junior colleges and the community colleges, that type of approach. There are assets out there. We should be reusing those assets. I think uh, that's a very important piece. And I've always wondered, you know, we have a license to do work in the city. Why aren't we taking a look at the records from DCRA to identify the next wave, the licenses that are yeah, being yeah. applied for? Mm -hmm. It's true. And then saying, hey, we see that this trend is emerging, and maybe we need to start working with our high schools and universities to figure out how to train people in these areas that we think are going to continue to grow. And I'm sure that there's much more than DCRA, but you were talking about uh, identifying streams of information and fusing that together and using big data is a way to make long-term actionable analytics. I'm sure that if we scratched our head and talked to some people, we could probably find some trending information and one more help thing make on, some of those decisions. Yeah, one more thing on that. And think about the, the resources, uh, you know, and to your example, you know, don't think that MGM wasn't involved in that. They need those workers. Sure, they, <laughs> they need people trained and ready to go to serve their customers. So when you're talking about that level of an industry or even cybersecurity mm -hmm. in my industry, we're out there too actively figuring out which universities do we need to partner with mm -hmm. in order to make sure there is a pipeline of technologists that will enable us to continue to serve our customers. So we, we not, even put, not only put in thought resources, but pure resources. So it's not that they would sit on their own trying to figure this out. Major industries always get involved with partners uh, from the academic world who really want to help us find that new generation of worker. It, it absolutely works. Let me give an example, UMBC, has called themselves a cybersecurity hub. It's not right. coincidental that they're close to NSA, right? And so they push their students in an area mm -hmm. such that when NSA and the Intel community are looking for them, they're saying, hey, they're right down the street. 
it's very big for the state of Maryland to keep the Intel organizations there. I think with the universities that we have here, as well as the community colleges, we can do the same thing because we have so much business here in the city. But we have to target, we talked about marketing. We have to market this city. It's very important that if we're gonna be a, a cyber or we're gonna be a tech hub, we have to market DC. Because when I go outside, people think government. When I, when I leave this city, we're a federal city, yeah. and, we, and they think in terms of federal city and doing contracting, not in terms of us being the tech center. And I think it's Which a big is, market. Which is one of our big challenges, and that is how do we stop being perceived largely as a company town? Mm -hmm. I mean, we are the nation's capital. Mm -hmm. We understand that. But I think, you know, to an increasing extent, we have our own, you know, we have our own distinct identity. You know, we now, and I talk about it everywhere I go, we have a population that is bigger than the state of Vermont, a population that's bigger than the state of Wyoming. And that, you know, our indigenous population largely does not work for the federal government. We have probably uh, about 25% of the people who live in the city who work for the federal government, which obviously means that 75% work for somewhere else. How, how do you, you know, and I see this elsewhere, how do you create enough indigenous pride in the business community, I'll call it pride in the business community, to say that, we're going to do whatever we have to do as technology emerges in this city to make sure that we give every advantage to the people who live in the city where we have our businesses. One of the things that's interesting is we talked about entrepreneurship, and I think you've been really talking about um, creating new businesses. And I've been to a, a, a few of the organizations where they, they're getting together and you go to universities. If we're able to start more businesses that are here locally, we're going to hire locally. Um, we, when, when they had the St. Elizabeth hub, hub, uh, hub and, and General Dynamics went over and L3 went over, what we didn't see was companies that were in, D, were in Southeast Washington starting to do some of the business of wiring St. Elizabeth. We didn't see that. And so as we talked about leveraging the contract, we're really talking about having an entrepreneurship perspective of if there are opportunities, whether they're federal or with the local government, that we're creating businesses as quickly as possible to do work there. Because if you're really talking about a sense of pride, I'm talking about a sense where I've created a business that's in Southeast Washington or that's in Northeast Washington to do work with an organization like St. Elizabeth where they're spending a lot of money over there. Mm -hmm. But that pride comes from the fact that um, it's, I created it and I'm working with other Washingtonians and we talk about not what college we went to, but a lot of times if you're Washington, you talk about what high school did you go to? And I think that's important that we have that sense of pride where we're starting businesses, mm -hmm. targeted in the tech center, but we have to start them here with our people, and that takes a partnership where we're mentoring those, those things. And you're right. There is a level of pride among you know, native Washingtonians. Mm -hmm. What high school did you go to? Mm -hmm. And then the trash talk can start. All the time. <laughs> but you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to translate into other areas in the same way, like business, where there's that same level of pride that gets you know, translated into trash talking about businesses and, you know, I got 80% of my employees who work for the, who live in the District of Columbia as opposed to just worried about having a workforce. Mm -hmm. we, um, we may have let you down, actually, because now kind of during this debate, when we start talking to people, we usually talk about our accomplishments and our work. We really don't really talk about our accomplishments as a Washingtonian or somebody yeah. that did something in Washington. And maybe there needs to be a, a discussion within the business community of how instead of the picture on the president and the White House logo where it says Washington, <laughs> D.C., we kind of change that a little bit. How about and District start, of Columbia? That's right. right. <laughs> uh -huh. We start talking about that. And, and that's, I think you made a good suggestion. We, we probably haven't done enough in that area. And it would benefit everybody. Every, all the residents, all the businesses, to have a, a different identity. Sense of ownership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I don't think we can, we can, I agree. I don't think we can do enough, but I, I do want to give credit to, to Barbara Lang and, and the chamber because they have been that voice for the business community. Now, what we translate inside our businesses is a different, a different issue. How does an individual employee who, who works uh, in uh, the District of Columbia convey that to his family or his peers? But certainly the, the work that the chamber has done for so many years and continues to do allows us that opportunity so that we can start to uh, rally around a point and start to push that more because it will be important for us as this a flywheel starts to turn and we start to build this momentum that as we have successes, 
we're actually able to point to them in a way that makes sense for a brand for the mm -hmm. District of Columbia. Karen? And I think that's one of the critical components is in terms of celebrating these successes too, just over and over and over and over. I mean, the little things in terms of the launch of a new business, if a new technology mm -hmm. business got funded, I mean, just the, the, the uh, and that obviously the leadership comes from the top on that, and, and it's a lot of work in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, celebrating those successes and celebrating entrepreneurs and cel celebrating businesses, but perhaps even recognizing those companies who have a certain percentage, mm -hmm. you know, of, you know, who have, you know, 90 or 100 percent of their employees, you know, are DC based. So perhaps there could be some recognition, um, you know, provided to these companies, and that could help, you know, uh, create a, a virtuous cycle, mm -hmm. you know, for other businesses to do the same. You know, I look at how uh, many years ago now, DuPont essentially took ownership of Delaware. Mm -hmm. sure that DuPont <laughs> and Delaware are essentially synonymous yeah. with one another. Absolutely. How do we create the same kind of synergy uh, in this city? It may not be a DuPont company, but maybe it's a sector. Maybe it's the technology sector that we become. People say silicon, and you immediately think technology. Mm -hmm. How do you get to the point where people think technology when you say DC? I say technology. I think we got them, y'all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and it obviously is not an easy question. Yeah. It's probably something that we could spend the entire yeah. afternoon talking about because you're trying to brand. You know, and DuPont essentially was branded, you know, they would brand it in, in, in concert with, um, you know, with Delaware. Yeah. What I'm looking for is how you create the same kind of dynamic here in the district. And, and you know, in a sense, we have been branded that way. We probably don't want to be at this stage, but you say Washington, D.C., and people think what? Government. Federal government, Federal right? Government. That's what we're trying to disconnect ourselves from to some extent. I mean, we're always going to be the seat of the federal government. That's not the issue that we're trying to become completely disconnected from that. The issue is how do we broaden and diversify our economy so that we're known for something more than just being yeah. the seat of the, the federal government. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer completely for you, but I, I will say one thing. I, I happen to also represent Delaware, so I'm very familiar with the operations <laughs> in Wilmington. Uh, and there is a difference. <laughs> uh, and you know, what's interesting to me, looking at the history of, of that, that company uh, and, the, and the city, there is one thing that was very, very, very clear. The city embraced them as if they were literally a part of that city. It, it, Wilmington, in their mind, could not function without DuPont. That's that. You talk, talk about a that's beyond partnership. Mm -hmm. That's marriage. <laughs> it, it was done. Signed, still the survival. So, <laughs> right, you're 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 in, and you're in for the partnership, not any individual piece of the partnership. And so, when you think about aspiring to something of that nature, uh, it, it, we have to get to the point where. And let's just take the tech community, that there is a marriage between the tech community and the District of Columbia, you know, spearheaded by you and the leaders of the tech community to say, we're going to do this. Here's the roadmap to make this happen and, and make it a short roadmap. But it's certainly available, but it is a mindset for me that, that uh, mm -hmm. made DuPont and Wilmington uh, synonymous. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, it's interesting. One of the things that, I, you know, I guess I'm going to apologize again, like Aja, I apologize to you. One of the things that's interesting, when, we, when I go to other cities and we're marketing some services because we've been successful in, in the district, one of the things we, we realize is that we are significantly more advanced than many of the other cities that we go to in, when it comes to solving problems mm -hmm. uh, via technology. Mm -hmm. And so we'll look at a certain service offering that we have in, in the District of Columbia. We look at some of the things that you've done in the administration when it comes to uh, leveraging technology to get government services. So we look at that and say, great, this would be great for another city. We go to the other city and they're looking at us like, how in the world did you do that? And I think we have not taken advantage of, okay, we're a government city, but we haven't taken advantage of the solutions that we put in place. You talked about some of the things that we've in terms of being able to leverage and get to government services now, where God knows I can pay my tickets online. 
uh, and and being able to. Do <laughs> <laughs> That's how you make up for the right. tax cut. Right. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. That was plural. <laughs> Tickets. Tickets. <laughs> Tickets. <laughs> Tickets. And I probably personally increased the GNP. <laughs> right. of we want to make it as easy. <laughs> as <possible>. <laughs> <laughs> But many of the services that we've, we've automated here and we take for granted aren't done in some of the other major cities. And if we want to be, we can really go out there and say, if you really want to learn how to do governmental systems and support and solutions, you talked about solutions already, you need to come to Washington mm -hmm. because we do not market that. And, and I've gone throughout many cities of the country trying to look at what they're doing. They're so far behind, we couldn't get them there because they don't understand certain things about governance. We, we actually are, uh, we, we've started to market uh, grade.dc.gov mm -hmm. because it has broad application. I mean, it's a kind of simple concept, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's development is not simple. Concept is simple in the sense that you're, you're giving the public an opportunity to express how it feels about the public services. That, you know, if the public is perceived as, uh, you know, a shareholder, when you are, you are a shareholder when you pay taxes, then you ought to have an opportunity to be able to have a say in how those services uh, are run. I, I would like to see us do more to market that, you know, but the issue is if our business community took ownership of it also and talked about it everywhere you go, mm -hmm. you know, every one of you travels somewhere. If you talked about what your city is doing, and I underscore your city, mm -hmm. that you take ownership of the city, and talk about the services that are being provided, the things that are being done. And as you said, Antoine, some things that really are uniquely being provided here mm -hmm. and not being done somewhere else. That instead of, I mean, how many, how many people get tired of, I, I've heard it for so long, well, if you want to find out how to, you know, put a rubber band together, go to Bismarck, uh, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, you know, I mean, here, mm -hmm. go, go, go to a lot of other places because it's always being done somewhere else. The, the, the pride in, that, of ownership from the mm -hmm. business community is help what is help, helps to communicate um, what the unique things that we are doing here. And what we are doing in the arena of technology, to me, puts us in the forefront uh, at this stage. Uh, to use what Tony said, are we great yet? No, I don't think we're great. Are we good? I think we are good. But we ought to all be aspiring to be great mm -hmm. uh, in that arena. That 20,000 new jobs in five years ought to be a piece of cake because we've committed ourselves to bring those companies here and create the kind of business environment that will want companies to be here and encourage them to incentivize uh, them to be here. Once that movement occurs, I think, in terms of you know, bringing in the companies and the technology companies and combine with you know, existing businesses. I think those types of themes or brand, you know, will develop organically perhaps into something, you know, a new brand that everyone can, you know, tie, mm -hmm. every, everyone's story ties back to. You know, what that is, we don't know yet, right? I guess, but. I think that you're right. We need to spend more time on the stories. And we have this one client, we save them $1.8 billion a year by implementing this technology. The client was so ecstatic, they made bumper stickers, I love, in the name of the program, and they started handing them out. You saved him $1.8 billion. A year for the last I'd be ecstatic, years. too. <laughs> <laughs> but I never thought about saying, and built in the District of Columbia. And I think mm. that's the next mm. part of the tagline. Wow. Exactly. And if we right. start mm. talking as a, a community, hey, we built something good, and we built it in the district, perhaps we get some positive identity out of mm -hmm. that, too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think we, we are within one minute of questions, so why don't we just start with the questions. Is that all right, David? First, let me uh, thank all of you for a, a, uh, a great exchange. And Mr. Mayor, I want to answer a question that you stomped all of them. Okay? <laughs> Uh, and that was, you asked, what do we need to do to brand the city with technology such that it's synonymous? I would suggest that you get, um, uh, and, and the chamber, I'll sign up for the chamber to start, start that process. But we have a lot of very smart companies in the chamber that do marketing and branding. Uh, and I would think that some of these companies would be more than willing to uh, do some pro bono work and let's get everybody oh, together and, oh, and really come up with a marketing branding campaign for the District mm -hmm. of Columbia. What do you all think about that? Good idea. Uh, Great. 
Will you also commit your marketing executives and your companies to serve on this little group? So we, we will, if that's well, something you'd no like to do. Well, there was no applause on that one. That's where it But I think that's worth like, exploring. <laughs> okay, I have several questions here, and if I can read them up here, there's not a lot of light. Uh, one, I think this is uh, for you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what is the top priority area for public investment in DC technology? In DC technology, mm -hmm. boy, that's a. Mm -hmm. I, I think you know. I think we we are working hard to build more startups uh, in the city. For example, we just invested in 1776. Uh, Jen, you can you can add to this if you uh, wish, but we just invested in 1776, a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, in order to help them open space. Uh, on 15th Street. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are moving into uh, 15,000 square feet initially. They could move, they could grow into mm -hmm. 60,000 square feet in that building. And they could wind up right with dozens of startups there. So for our purposes, I think we're trying to proliferate the number of firms that see themselves uh, as having a home uh, here in the District of Columbia. One, because we probably incent them, and then secondly, because they feel that they have taken on the mantra uh, of the city. Right. Jen, did you want to add to that? What I was saying is that 1776 is a unique opportunity because it builds on the assets that make the district special. We're not trying to create something that the Valley has. We're not just trying to uh, copy what we're seeing in other cities, but rather we're seizing on the, the assets that we have. For instance, we have access to every uh, corporation and every association in the country through, through a lobbying office or a major presence. And that creates opportunities for startups that are looking for partners or people to acquire them or customers. Um, additionally, we have access to major capital. We sit in some of the richest counties in the country, and not all of that capital has been activated, but something like 1776 is trying to do that. And one last piece that I want to touch on, which also goes back to what the panel was discussing quite a bit, is education. Uh, 1776 has a major startup school component, which will um, take the people who are coming back to DC as veterans. It will take the people who are losing positions because of sequestration or other budget cuts, however that shakes out, and it will train them up so that they are ready to work in the, the companies that are looking at other sectors outside the federal government. So there's a great opportunity there, and that's why we're investing in something like 1776. Anybody Thank you. know why it's named 1776? Because we consider it a revolution. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. I think also, in fact, I'm going, I, I was delighted. I had a conversation with Stan Voudry of um, Four Points um, mm -hmm. last week, and there are, um, they have provided space in Ward 8, and I was delighted to see that, I think, for, start, for some startups. I think some of them are technology companies as well. And so I'm going over in a couple of weeks mm -hmm. to kind of tour, tour that. So that's just great to kind of see that kind of activity going on. If I can just add to that, Barbara, what a lot of people may not know, and that we are still in talks, but I'm, almost, I'm certain that it's going to happen. I'm certain, but I think it will happen. That we've got three firms that we're talking to to locate um, innovation centers in Ward 8 mm -hmm. on the grounds of St. E's. Mm -hmm. Sidlam, Smart BIM, and for the first time this company will have an innovation center if they come here. Uh, they'll be the first innovation center outside of their headquarters in Redmond, Washington uh, in the United States, and that would be Microsoft. Mm -hmm. well, can you imagine Microsoft in Ward 8? Well, <laughs> hey Barbara, you, do you mind doing great. a commercial for our new committee tying into why don't you do that? <laughs> well, you know, as, as chair, one of the things that we're very proud about, and I'm going to let Ajahn, that's how I was able to persuade him to chair this committee, but we have a new federal contracting committee that is really focused on not only federal and local contracting, uh, but also small businesses in an international realm. And uh, I was able to uh, convince Ajahn to come on and chair, chair that particular committee. But the whole focus is to really talk about federal and local contracting, um, tying into how do you go about getting folks ready to do business with the district um, so that they're prepared and can be successful when they get there. And so we really want to look at opportunities and helping, helping make sure they're shaped correctly. Uh, on the small business side, we're really looking at there 
not so much getting them to be such an active participant in the chamber from a perspective of what um, they, what, what we need from them, but really getting them prepared from a small business perspective, getting introductions, getting them prepared to do business. And then on the international side, partnering with Export DC uh, to have some really focused area in getting companies that are prepared to do business in China, uh, in Canada, in Brazil, such that um, tying into what the chamber does, focusing to what the district does. And I think it's very important. Um, I'm hoping folks from 1776 uh, graduate, and we would love to partner there because uh, I think Ajahn is, is a great leader for that particular committee. Anyone mm -hmm. add anything to that? You've already said too many highlights. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Um, next question. Um, what other cities, and this is probably for anybody on the panel, which other cities are the, that you are aware of are really doing a good job in technology attraction uh, to their city? And what, if you can name some, mm -hmm. then what are they doing well and how can we emulate them? Um, the two that I'll mention, um, and I think they're tied to the local economy, is Charleston, South Carolina, and San Diego. And what they've done is, obviously those are DOD cities, but what they've really done is they have a group of individuals that meet on a monthly basis down in Charleston. And they get folks from, that are doing business with the government to meet with uh, the vendors. And they literally get these guys prepared to do business with the government and saying, here's what they want, here's what they don't want. And it's almost a mentoring that they do on a quarterly basis. And I've seen them um, grow enormously to the point where they're trying to, interestingly enough, tra attract people from D.C. to those areas. Mm -hmm. And we've also discussed putting together some type of technical assistance program yeah. to help promising organizations accelerate through. And we've also talked about mentorship as well mm -hmm. because we believe that other companies that have um, different product or service can only help the overall community and uh, the overall image of the community too. I, think I, I was on a, oh, go ahead. Mayor, please, go ahead. Well, I, you know, some of the cities that are doing well, I mean, the, um, the likely suspects, like, you know, the Bostons and the Silicon Valley, I mean, they're, they're accelerators and they're incubators and sort of their, their uh, innovation initiatives uh, in attracting uh, you know, technology companies and investment are, are mature now, and I think we're learning a lot from them. And, um, and, uh, and in New York, uh, you know, the same thing. I mean, they're, uh, really their whole entrepreneurial scene and their ability to uh, uh, attract uh, technology companies is only just new. And they just replicated what some of these other cities did in terms of incubators, accelerators. Certainly there was a commitment by uh, the administration uh, and by the leaders, uh, you know, the government uh, in those cities to uh, help in terms of financial support. Um, and also helping to build collaborative uh, relationships as well with the bigger companies, the smaller companies, and also the financial component, mm -hmm. the venture capital community, mm -hmm. uh, and the finance sectors. Because mm -hmm. uh, it all you know, kind of comes together. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Conne the connecting, you right. know, making the connections and making it work and seeing it through. Mr. Mayor? I was on a panel recently, right, right before the last mayor's, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting. Um, our staff was connected with some folks, and I was on a panel with three other mayors. Um, and it was really interesting to listen to the mayor of Kansas City uh, talk. Uh, first of all, he is thoroughly Im immersed now in technology. And the catalyst for them was the location of Google mm -hmm. in Kansas mm -hmm. City. Mm -hmm. And um, they obviously have a relationship where you can see very soon the branding of Kansas City and Google. Can you imagine that? Wow. Uh, but the presentation that they, they did, they've obviously already established a relationship. They, they've already obviously uh, got a number of things going. I don't know how many jobs yet have emanated from that relationship, but um, you can see before too long, Google in Kansas City may be synonymous. Interesting. That goes my branding, marketing. There you go. Again, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Exposure to IT jobs is critical to growing our indigenous DC workforce. What should employers do to partner with schools and what policies and encouragement do employers need to get involved? We've, um, <clears throat> we've actually asked the staff to get involved in the community a little bit differently and a few of them are actually in classrooms providing guidance on math and other scientific subjects. So where we started a couple of years ago with uh, one person, I think we're up to four or five people, 
And uh, I think that that's the most heartfelt type of outreach because it's being done by the staff. Mm -hmm. And because it's being done by the staff, other people want to be a part of that. And they do see that they've had an impact on a child's life. So I think that corporations have to suggest that, and even small companies like ours, we're a few hundred people, um, we can make a difference if we encourage our people to go out there and do it. And um, a couple of people kind of came back and they said, look, if we had an opportunity to run a race to make some uh, money for this charity or we had a, a chance to uh, make an impact on a child's life, what would the company prefer? And obviously we preferred the latter, but we also had suggested to them, look, don't make it a one-off. Make sure you get a core group of people because once you start this, you want there to be continuity as well. Now, that, that, that's well said. I, I think the, um, the, the direct involvement model uh, is one that's key to the health of the university uh, or school and, and the business. We most recently provided a grant to the University of the District of Columbia on sustainability. And people don't tend to think about sustainability mm -hmm. and Verizon, but if you think about all the aspects of our business and everything we touch, uh, we have a significant imp imprint on the carbon imprint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we're trying to reduce that. And what better way than to work with universities, uh, particularly local ones, to see what they're doing, help their students understand how we individually uh, affect that. And it kind of circles back. So it's back to the direct involvement, the partnerships. That will then spawn other initiatives inside STEM to do other work. So mm -hmm. it's that direct involvement that's always the key. I would love to see our business community, and I'll be more specific, maybe this is one where the organizations can come together, the Chamber, the Board of Trade, DCBIA, um, the Developers Roundtable, um, you know, all come together and say, you know what, we are going to completely embrace the community college mm -hmm. because that is our workforce or not our workforce. And we're going to do what's necessary to lift up the community college, to move it towards being uh, an independent uh, entity, to make sure that the curricula are attuned to the jobs that are emerging in the District of mm -hmm. Columbia, mm -hmm. and make sure that the leadership in that community college understands what the city's economic development plan is, mm -hmm. and frankly have to, have to come to sessions like this. Yep come to sessions like this and explain what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. Anybody in here from the community college? Well. No. Okay. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Durham, and I assume this is Durham, North Carolina, mm -hmm. a large landowner discounted less desirable commercial space to be used by only tech startups. We have several local landlords similar to this uh, in D.C. as the landlord in Durham. What has the city done to connect to local landlords to offer and maybe incentivize or somehow subsidize this sort of deal for, to, for tech startups? And I guess that's to you, Mr. Mayor. I don't think the others can answer yeah, they, that. They can jump in. That's, that's, <laughs> that's in a sense what we did with 1776. Uh, because they located space in a key part of the city on 15th Street. But in order to be able to help them get moving, we provided a grant of $200,000. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there'll be other ways in which, you know, David and Jen will be working with them. But we did provide money right from the very beginning. Uh, and we actually had the launch right there in order to be able to make sure that people in the city understood our commitment to uh, 1776 and our relationship to supporting them getting started. I think you did that with the fort too, didn't you? A little, uh, yeah. Something similar to the fort. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. We gave $100,000 to the fort. The right. fort was actually uh, already in existence. Mm -hmm. They were located. Uh, Weren't they going to move? Yeah, yeah. They, they were moving from Sterling, Virginia to closer in, but they were going to stay in Virginia. Yeah. And again, our staff worked with them. I, I met with, um, with Jonathan Pirelli uh, in, in December of 2011. And um, we continued to work with them, and they decided to move into the city. They moved into K Street, and the fort is moving into, uh, into 1776 mm -hmm. also, yeah. so that they will be another entity as a part of uh, facilitating Absolutely. the startups there. Absolutely. Um, okay. uh, DCRA has improved, and I don't know whether, I, I haven't seen Nick Majette, uh, the director yet. 
but this says DCRA has improved but needs more business friendly training. Is there any focus on that, uh, on that unit uh, regarding licensing and permits? And second, part, second question unrelated to the first, where does free internet access stand for the DC underserved population, particularly those in public housing? Well, on DCRA, I think Nick Bajet has done an incredible job. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a, is a reformed um, agency, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I mean, I use the example of uh, there was a process involving rental housing that took six months at one point, and now it takes one day. Mm -hmm. uh, as a result of one, the reformed processes there and also the use of technology uh, to be able to facilitate mm -hmm. that. Nick, along with David, will be chairing the Business Regulatory Reform Task Force. Mm -hmm. And their job will be to not only look at DCRA, but to look at other government agencies across the board to see how we can strip away those things that may strangle uh, business mm -hmm. uh, here in the city. In terms of free uh, you know, internet access, we of course have our libraries. Uh, we now, we have 25 libraries in the city. Many of them have been either rebuilt or uh, modernized uh, under the leadership of Jenny Cooper. She's done a great job. Um, and there is free internet access in those libraries. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, large technology, government contractors, et cetera, firms are very different from startups and entrepreneurs. Which is the most important of the two to promote and what steps do we need to, to take to do so, to be successful? I think anybody. I think we, be, we belong to an and society. It's both. It is, mm -hmm. I agree with I, you. I don't think it's one or the other. I don't think mm -hmm. we need to choose either. And I think there's room in the marketplace for both to coexist. Absolutely. We operate completely differently. Um, large organizations, they have a place, they have um, resources, capacity, they, they fill a very important market and I think small businesses, um, their focus really is on agility and direct customer relationships and some innovation and when you actually put the two together, that's the unleashing of tremendous power mm -hmm. and I would advocate a, an AND model. Tony? That's, that's, excuse me. No, go ahead. Well, go ahead. that's what we're trying to do uh, in, in, in with the startups and then bringing Microsoft uh, right. here. Right, exactly. Yeah, at the end of the day, we're trying to bring solutions to customers. Uh, and it's not one individual customer, it's the ecosystem of the technology company's customer. And so you can't, I mean, it's great to have a network, but if you don't have great devices and great applications, it's useless to you. And so it is, in fact, every aspect of that ecosystem of technology companies that makes your life simpler. Uh, the final uh, card that I have here is part of turning DC into a technology capital is growing the IT customer base. In some neighborhoods, broadband adoption is less than 40%. Yeah. What can we do to bring all DC residents into uh, the modern day technology? Well, I mean, the easy answer is to say, you know, do the wiring. And if you, when, when, I, when I came into office, we had our own Octo actually engaged in that, and they started in Ward 8. I was with them the day that they started. They started uh, right adjacent to uh, Berry Farm. But it's, it's more than that. It's also educating, especially our children, to the importance of this, these opportunities to their own uh, futures. And that has to happen in substantial part in our schools. Uh, and I go back to early childhood education. There's absolutely no reason why we should not be exposing three and four year olds to these, these, uh, these opportunities mm -hmm. in our schools. Uh, so I think it's education, uh, access, the, the, the challenge of access has diminished considerably uh, because uh, DC Net, first of all, is a uh, 99 gigabit system, which is the biggest, I think, of any municipality uh, in the nation. Mm -hmm. So we've got capacity. Now we've got to have the capacity of the people and understanding the power of those systems. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from anybody else on that one? Okay, this concludes uh, the Q&A portion of our program and I'd like to thank our audience today for your participation uh, and your insightful questions. Uh, if um, I, I hope to see all of you, the next big event that the Chamber has coming up is our Small Business uh, Champions Awards and Expo 
on May 23rd, so we hope to see uh, all of you there. Um, now, I, I, I don't want you to leave this, this place thinking that uh, this was nice and entertaining conversation and insightful uh, and nothing gets done. If my mayor doesn't hear from me in a week, <laughs> maybe 10 days, I will get a phone call from him <laughs> saying, Barbara, where are the notes and the to-dos and the action items uh, from this forum? And then I turn to David and say, David, where are the notes? So I want you to understand that the mayor takes these, this very seriously, and we provide him all of this information such that then he can go to see what needs to change in inside the district government to, to kind of break away, uh, get rid of these barriers. So um, this, this, this will go on for, uh, for quite a while, and we will have some homework to do uh, at the chamber. Now, before we adjourn to the legislative uh, reception, and uh, we have a few council members, I understand, that will be joining us. So you can talk to them about that piece of legislation that they didn't yeah. pass. I think that would be, you know, while they have a cocktail in their hands, this may be a good time to do that. Don't you think so, Mr. Mayor? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's because one big coalition. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'd like to introduce now our forum partner, and he will—he is the partner for us on all of the forums for 2013, and we are so, so glad to have he and his team and to work so closely. Please uh, uh, welcome Harold Pettigrew, the director of DC's uh, Department of Small and Local Business Development, who will close out today for us. Harold, come forward. Thank you for being here. That veto ready. <laughs> Thank you very much, Barbara. And, and I'll just be just a moment or two. But really, can we give another round of applause for Barbara? <laughs> you know, it, it's certainly from our vantage point, uh, uh, certainly with the agency, it makes it very easy. To, to provide as much support as we possibly can because of the good work that's being done. You know, with these types of conversations where the public and, and public and private partners can come together and have this kind of important dialogue, it's, 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 it's just tremendous. Um, and I couldn't applaud you more for the leadership, Barbara, that you've applied to the chamber uh, for years now. Um, and certainly the friend that you've been uh, to the agency and, and, and to the government, really. Um, and certainly uh, Antoine as well with his leadership and his energy uh, uh, being the chair now for the chamber. Uh, it's certainly a, ple a, a pleasure for me and certainly a privilege to work with both of you um, and support however we can. Uh, next, and certainly thanks, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for laying out a bold vision for many of us as agency directors and truly allowing for us to you know, be aggressive and, and think through how we can partner uh, and create some public-private partnerships so that we can have dynamic conversation about where we need to go. This is an exciting time in the district. It's no question about it. And if you isolate all the many initiatives that were talked about, not only during the panel, but during some of the Q&A, I would be hard pressed to believe that there are many other cities that can match what's happening right now here in the district. I, and I'm, I'm just taking that moment to see some of you just nod your heads for a moment because I think sometimes we, we really have to take that moment and just appreciate what is happening here. We know that we still have a, a, a long ways to go to make things perfect or to improve the business environment, but I tell you, it's an exciting time right now here in the city. And I think there, there's definitively no one can deny that. Uh, so certainly, I wanna thank you all for certainly being here, and this type of conversation is what needs to continue. You know, a lot of things have been very exciting. Uh, Jen talked about 1776, and certainly uh, the mayor and, and his efforts to support many of these tech initiatives that have happened over the last uh, uh, 24 months or so. It's been a lot, a lot of investment, and the mayor putting, quite frankly, uh, his, his, his money with uh, uh, his thoughts and his direction. You know, so it's an exciting time here in the city. Uh, we've had a chance to, to launch a number of initiatives, uh, as well as Connect Tech, Mr. Mayor, at Bioscan uh, a couple weeks back in January, mm -hmm. where that'll be our effort to support small businesses going after tech opportunities uh, as well. So we certainly look forward to uh, continuing our work with the Chamber. Thank you all for coming here today, um, and, and we certainly are, are here to support as we can. And I think uh, to answer your question a little bit as well, Mr. Mayor, about uh, how we can get D.C. to be known uh, as a tech city, uh, it may 
not be there quite yet, but certainly with these type of efforts and initiatives that have already happened, we're already well on our way. So thank you very much for having uh, me, and thank you very much again uh, to the chamber and the leadership here, and as well to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you.